I'm so excited for this one. I love these books. I love them. Hey, Amelia. It is a well-known and well-documented fact that I am a lover of terrible books. And let me tell you, it all started here with the Selection series. I can't tell you why I love these books so much. They are objectively not very good, but I think I just read them at the exact right time in my cognitive development that they just stuck with me. These books have everything. There is a pretty annoying main character, a horrible love triangle, impending civil war. The cherry on top of it all is that the author got into a little bit of controversy after publishing the first book and I cannot wait to tell you about it. If by the end of this you are not convinced to read these books, I have failed as a human, okay? Let's get strapped in. This is gonna be a doozy. I sat down to write out some notes just to make sure that like I didn't miss any of the main plot points. I was like, you know, a couple pages. It's 15 pages long. Grab a drink of water, grab a snack. You can put me on two times speed in the background if you want because I love these books and I cannot wait to talk about them. Before before I get going describing this unhinged plot, I think I have to introduce you into the world. We are in dystopian North America. It is the future. I don't think we ever get an exact date. It's a country called Ilya. It was founded by a guy named Gregory Ilya. They go into the history of it. I don't give a shit. All that's important is they have an absolute monarchy ruled by a man named, what's the king's name? King Clarkson Shreve. The prince is named Maxson Shreve. He is one of our love interests. The main construct that this world exists in is a caste system. So there are eight castes, the ones, the royal family. Twos are celebrities, politicians, athletes, rich people. Threes are people who have well-respected jobs, so teachers, doctors, office workers, that sort of thing. Fours are farmers, factory workers, and shopkeepers. Fives are artists. That is the caste that our main character belongs to. Then we have sixes who are servants, sevens, outdoor laborers, the eights. A Allegedly, there was a deleted scene from a chapter in the first book. Eights are people who had been abandoned or orphaned with no way to prove their caste. And then people who fell into heavy drug use, the mentally and physically handicapped. They were all unemployable and left in the streets to beg. So basically, poor people, people with substance use disorder, and disabled people. Now, we absolutely do not have time to unpack all of that. I trust that you have some critical thinking and you can understand why that's uncomfortable. You might be wondering, how do people get their castes? Well, you're born into it, but the castes were created when the country was founded. The founder of the country divided people into castes based on how able they were to help him overthrow the government. If you didn't have anything to give him back then, your family's fucked forever, basically. This country kind of sucks. There are no social services. They don't have food banks. They don't have minimum wage. They don't have free public schooling for the lower castes. It seems like a terrible time. Book one. It's a doozy. So we meet our glorious main character. Her name is America Singer. Already off to a wild start. America is a five. So she sings and plays a bunch of different instruments and her family is like pretty poor, but they love each other. She has two alive parents. Shocker for a 2012 YA dystopia novel. She also has two grown siblings. They're unimportant. Then she has two younger siblings. May's a painter. Jared likes soccer, which is not good. America has a secret relationship with a guy named Aspen. Aspen is a six. His family has a lot of kids and they have no money. And Aspen and America are in love. Every night they sneak out past curfew. They meet up in America's treehouse. I just have to get one thing straight right out the gate. I hate Aspen. He is whiny, he's annoying, he's selfish, and he's stupid. I hate him, but America's in love. America and Aspen really want to get married. There's a couple problems. Aspen is a six and America is a five, and because in this future there is still a patriarchal society, even though America is a five, if she marries Aspen, who's a six, she'll be a six. So already Aspen is not super sold on the idea of marriage because he doesn't want to turn America into a six. But then also there's the pesky little problem that is the draft. In Ilya, every 19-year-old male was eligible for the draft. 
Soldiers were chosen at random twice a year to catch everyone within six months of their birthday. You served from the time you were 19 until you're 23. Aspen is like, I don't want to get married before the draft because I don't want you to have to like wait for me. One day, a letter arrives in the mail. And this letter says, The recent census has confirmed that a single woman between the ages of 16 and 20 currently resides in your home. We would like to make you aware of an upcoming opportunity to honor the great nation of Ilya, our beloved prince, Max and Shreve is coming of age this month. As he ventures into this new part of his life, he hopes to move forward with a partner to marry a true daughter of Ilya. If your eligible daughter or sister or charge is interested in becoming a possible bride of Maxon and the adored princess of Ilya, please fill out the enclosed form and return to your local province services office. They're holding a little competition. It's like The Bachelor. They're going to invite one girly from every province in the country to compete for the crown and also for Prince Maxon's true love. America is immediately like, mm, I don't want to do that. America's mom is like, doesn't hurt to just submit your name. We're probably not going to get chosen anyway. That evening, Aspen's like, did you hear about the selection? And America's like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And he's like, no, you have to. I would never forgive myself if you didn't submit your name so america's like okay fine if it'll make you happy i'll submit myself the next morning america's about to tell her mom that she's changed her mind she's gonna submit for the selection but her mom doesn't know this yet so her mom is like listen if you submit your name for the selection i will let you keep 50 percent of your paycheck for any solo gigs you do from here on out and america's like hell yeah that sounds like a great deal america's gonna be able to start saving money for the wedding that she's gonna have with aspen she goes to the office and submits her thing. She runs into Aspen's mom. And Aspen's mom is like, we think Aspen's about to propose to somebody. He's been really happy. He's been saving some money. We don't know who she is, but I think he's gonna propose really soon. America's over the moon. So that night, she makes a little meal to bring to Aspen that's like celebratory. They're celebrating that she's about to get engaged, celebrating the selection, and also celebrating the fact that she now is gonna have some money to save up for their wedding. You know what a normal rational person would do? Be like, oh my goodness, thank you so much for cooking this meal for me. You know what Aspen does because he is the worst he freaks out because his fragile little masculine ego can't handle that someone is doing something nice for him i'm not some charity case america i'm a man i'm supposed to be the provider red freaking flag man so america is who's just trying to do something nice is like no like this was a gift your mom told me that you were gonna propose like i'm really excited aspen is like i can't stand the thought of you hungry or cold or scared i can't make you a six and america's like i don't care i'm in love with you and Aspen is like, let's break up. I literally, literally hate that man. He breaks up with her. America is distraught. And then literally a week after our girl America gets chosen for the freaking selection. And she's like, you know what? Maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Aspen broke up with me. I get to go to the palace and eat some nice food and like hang out with some cool people and forget about Aspen. She has to sign a contract that says she is henceforth property of Ilya, which is so nasty and gross. And she also has to sign another contract that says that she is in fact a virgin right before she leaves. A man from the palace comes in and he pulls her aside and he's like, this isn't exactly a rule, but it would be unwise of you to ignore it. When you are invited to do something with Prince Maxon, you do not refuse. No matter what it is, dinners, outings, kisses, more than kisses, anything, do not turn him down. So she already is like a bit apprehensive of the prince guy because he's a prince and she's poor. But now she hates him. In the love triangle that has been set up, there are no good options. She should stay single. Try lesbianism, girl. I heard it's great. So she has this big old send off. Aspen is there with another girl. So she gets to the airport and she meets two girls from the selection, Marley, who instantly becomes her best friend, and then some other girl who is unimportant. Once they get to the palace, they have a makeover. It is very America's Next Top Model core. Fast forward, it's the nighttime. America is having a panic attack. She's like, what have I done? What am I doing here? I'm in love with Aspen, I just ruined everything. She's like, I just need to go outside. So she runs down in her nightdress to like the door to the gardens and the guards are like, no, you can't go outside. Guess who shows up? Frickin Maxon. And he's like, let her outside. Make no mistake, this is not a meet cute. She's angry. And America is yelling at him. She's like, I hate you, you're stuck up and I don't even know why I'm here. I'm here by mistake, I hate it here. This is like a cage. And then they go back inside and Maxon is like, hey, do me a favor, I'm not supposed 
supposed to meet you guys officially until tomorrow so just don't tell anyone about this we wake up tomorrow morning max is like hi i'm just gonna like do a quick one-on-one -on -one with everybody just to meet people the america comes up to him she's like i'm so sorry i didn't mean to yell at you i was going through a lot like if you're gonna send me home now i totally get it and max is like you said you were here by mistake what's that all about and she's like i'm in love with someone else max is like do you want me to send you home so you can go be with him and she's like well no that's the problem i can't be with him he broke up with me and he has a new girlfriend maxon and america strike up a little friendship maxon is like so what if i keep you around for as long as you want but we're just friends like as soon as you want to go home you can go home and america's like that would be great thank you so much just from their one-on-ones maxon eliminates eight people from 35 to how 35 minus eight 27 27 people left, which is still like a lot of people. Maxon takes America on the date to the gardens. It starts to get a little weird. There's no cameras around. There's no guards around. Maxon starts getting a bit closer to her. He like tucks her hair behind her ear and then America knees him in the crotch. Maxon flips out. He's like, what the fuck, girl? And she's like, don't ever touch me again. I'm leaving. This is the first of many max in america fights a couple days later oh no tragic there's a rebel attack they have to go into lockdown they go down to a safe room america's like i'm really sorry some guy told me that if you propositioned me i couldn't turn you down so i need you in the crotch and maxon was like what who's going around saying that like that's so rude i would never like i'm a gentleman all is forgiven maxon tells america about the rebels there's two different types of rebels there's the northern rebels and the southern rebels the northern rebels they're silly they're goofy they're just here for a good time they run in they like rummage through all the rooms they like steal stuff now the southern rebels that is where the problem is the southern rebels want to abolish the monarchy and they do that by killing people Listen, killing people is wrong, but I have to say I don't believe that their cause abolishing the monarchy is like way off base. During the rebel attacks, if they're northern rebels, you're fine. Like you might get knocked out, but you're not going to be killed. If it's the southern rebels, people are dying. Bodies are dropping. This first rebel attack was northern rebels, so nothing really happened. Just a couple of things were stolen. So Maxon and America are just friends, but like friends who might kiss. You know, they're constantly hanging out with each other. A bunch of time passes, nothing really happens. So one day, America just really wants to hang out with Maxon and he's super busy. So she writes him a little note that's like, haha, come on down. And Maxon runs out of his office and he's like storming downstairs. He's like, what's happened? Are you okay? Is your family dead? And America's like, sorry, I just wanted to hang out. I was bored. And Maxon starts complaining about his job. And America's like, girl, you're the prince. You're rich. Don't complain. It's very much like, Good. there's people that energy and america's like have you ever been hungry and he's like i mean yeah i've been ready for dinner and she's like no 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 i mean have you ever been like starving there's no food and you guys haven't eaten for a couple days or you have to pick between keeping the heat on in the winter or having food to eat and he's like god do people actually live like that how out of touch are you these are your people like you are the prince you should know this right you should know that your country is like super poor that's like common knowledge wow shocker people experience food insecurity in this country with no social support and he's baffled by this and he's like people still shouldn't steal yeah like breaking the law is bad but also like sometimes there's no choice it's baffling to me that this country doesn't already have like some social support like a food bank and a minimum wage and like public schools so maxin a girl of action he decides that he is going to set up a food bank Ooh, every province is gonna have a food bank the bare fucking minimum to fund this he's gonna cut all of the reward money from all of the girls in the selection who are a three or above one day america and maxin are hanging out on her balcony maxin kisses america and america's like whoa what the fuck happened dude like we were just friends he's super apologetic america kisses max in this time i am firmly team max in so a few days later they have some diplomats visiting from a country called swendway yep that's the name of a country in this book swendway and all the selection girlies are hanging out outside with the king and queen of swendway marley america's best friend comes up to america and is like hey girl um i have a problem i don't think i'm in love with maxon we've talked and whatever but like i just don't see a future with him and america's like oh well, like that's no big deal maxon is super reasonable i'm sure if you told him that you just didn't feel that way about him he'd send you home no harm no foul and marley's like no i have to stay here don't tell anyone about this and then she goes away the next day america and maxon are walking in the hallway they run in to freaking ask 
Aspen. America sees Aspen and she's like, <gasps> and Maxon is like, oh, word, do you know him? Aspen, yes, anding the crap out of this situation. He's like, oh yeah, like we're from the same province. Like we went to school together. Improv king. Maxon is like, oh, no way. Hey, America, how would you feel about Aspen being on your personal guard rotation? America's like, yeah, sure. He has no idea what he just did. See, I feel so bad for Maxon because he's just trying to be nice. Aspen got conscripted into the draft. He got placed as a palace guard. Now he is almost constantly stationed outside of America's room. Things are about to get weird. America and Maxon are constantly fighting. So they'll be fine one moment and then something will happen and they won't talk to each other. And so this is exactly what happens towards the end of the book. America, who is like starting to catch feelings for Maxon, is like, hey, you gotta send Celeste home. She sucks. And Maxon is like, you forget yourself, Lady America. It would do you well to remember that I am the crown prince of Ilya. For all intents and purposes, I am lord and master of this country and I'll be damned if you think you can treat me like this in my own home. You don't have to agree with my decisions, but you will abide by them. This is a different side of Maxon that we haven't seen before, and I don't like it. This is when Aspen, he walks into America's room, and they start committing literal treason. Aspen, you made your choice. Maybe just live with the consequences of your own actions, maybe. Like, if you didn't want to break up with America, you shouldn't have broken up with America. This is not sexy to me. This is scary. So quietly, it felt like I was dreaming it. Aspen cracked open the door, walked in, and shut it behind him. Do you love him? I look into Aspen's deep eyes, barely visible in the dark. For a split second, I don't know what to say. No. He ripped my blankets back in a move both graceful and violent. His hand was behind my head, pushing my face to his. I'm so over him. I hate him. The punishment for this is being killed. No man is worth it. Especially not freaking Aspen. The guy who broke up with you because you made him a meal. That is not a man worth getting killed over. A couple days later, massive rebel attack. So this rebel attack is a northern rebel attack, and so nobody is killed, but it does spook the girlies really bad. And a bunch of girls ask to go home. Maxon decides he is only gonna pe keep people here who he can see himself marrying. So he does a mass elimination. But Maxon says he's gonna eliminate everybody but six people. And remember, America and Maxon aren't on good terms right now. The six people that he keeps are Marley, Chris, Natalie, Celeste, Elise, and America. Girlie makes it to the second round. Most of these girlies did not come up much in the first book. I will give you a brief introduction to them. Marley, America's best friend. She's not in love with Maxon at all. Chris. Chris was a three. She's role boring. She's barely mentioned in the first book, but she becomes really important in some of the later books, so keep her in your brain. Natalie, also super boring and she never becomes important so you don't have to remember her. Celeste. Celeste was a two and Celeste is a bitch. Then we have Elise. Elise is here because she has family connections but she's barely mentioned in the first book and then obviously we have our girl America. Those are the six girlies of the elite. Obviously America is super relieved to have made it to the second round of the competition. Aspen as always is like super butthurt about this. He's like, why are you relieved? I thought you didn't love him. And America's like, girl, it's complicated. America tries to set a nice little boundary with Aspen. I'm part of the selection now. I'm here for Maxon and I can't date you or whatever this is while this is going on. So obviously Aspen gets more butthurt about this and he's like, I'll never stop fighting for you, America. Even though America made it abundantly clear she's not into that anymore. God, Aspen and his fragile fucking masculinity can't handle that. I hate him. I literally hate him. So we end book one with America being like, I am in it to win it. The selection is no longer something that was simply happening to me, but something I was actively a part of. I was an elite. And that's the end of book one. So I mentioned at the beginning Beginning, that this book has some controversy that comes along with it. I only recently learned about this controversy, actually. It is the funniest thing. So basically, after this book was released, a reviewer posted a less than favorable review on Goodreads and also her personal blog. I couldn't find the review. I tried. I promise you I tried to look for it, but like it's gone from the internet. Uh, Kira Cass, the author of this book, was not happy about this one star review. Her and her public publishing agent had a public Twitter exchange, basically calling the reviewer a bitch, saying she was like illiterate, talking about how they can artificially bump the positive reviews so that people wouldn't see the negative reviews as quickly. Don't do that. Reviews are for readers. Now, the funny part of this 
is that this Twitter exchange that was happening, Kira Cass and her publishing agent thought they were privately DMing each other, but they were tweeting back and forth publicly. That's hilarious. The tweet that everyone is all up in arms about, it says, at Kira Cass, that bitch at the top is really pissing me off. She complains before reading, then barely reads, then complains. What's her deal? You know, it's not the worst thing that anyone has ever said ever. Here's a thought. Don't cyberbully reviewers. Hot take, which is actually a very cold take. Reviews are not for the author. It's so that readers and consumers of content know what they want to put their money and more importantly, I think their time behind. On Goodreads, you can sort from like lowest review to highest review. You can sort by only one star reviews. Just because you bumped the five star reviews up to the top doesn't mean the one star reviews aren't going to be seen. Even for books that I like, I like reading one star reviews. So anyway, I just cannot get over the fact that they thought they were texting privately and yet they were just tweeting back and forth publicly on Twitter. That is too much for me. Anyway, book two. Quick little recap as to where we're at so far. I think we all need it. We came into the competition with 35 girls. There are now six girlies left. Chris, Elise, Natalie, Celeste, Marley, and America. America and Maxon are not on great terms, but clearly Maxon likes America enough to keep her in the final six. America has told Aspen that she is hashtag team Maxon, but Aspen is like, I won't give up. We're all caught up. Great, good, awesome. At the beginning of the second book, Maxon and America are in love again, I guess. I'm sure they explain it, but I don't care. Maxon tells America to like ask him any question and America is like, what's Halloween? Because I guess in the future, we don't have Halloween. That's not a future I want to be a part of. I love Halloween. I'm going to put up a picture of me as Elvis. I dressed up as Elvis one year. Best costume ever. In a future where there's no Halloween, I'm not involved, okay? Maxon brings America to this secret library and they find a book. It's Gregory Ilya's Diary. Big deal diary of the man who created the country there's a diary entry that talks about halloween and america seems really interested and so maxon is like hey listen like you can borrow his diary just hide it and then like when you're done with it just give it back to me they decide to throw a halloween party super exciting everyone's gonna get dressed up in costumes they're gonna invite everybody's family and america is super excited the thing is is america is still trying to decide between Maxon and Aspen. Even though one is clearly superior, she's got one option who is the prince. He's rich, he likes her, he wants to marry her. You know, not treasonous to be with. And she has one option who is a stupid idiot, who I hate, is super insecure and has like a horrible ego and has no concept of boundaries. And who's not rich? Who are we picking? Who, I don't know, who are we picking? Cause I know who I would pick. And it's the one who is far superior in every way. So they have this Halloween party. And at the end of the evening, Maxon takes America's side and is like, let's get married. And America's like, oh my God, yes. They go to bed the next morning, America's maids wake her up. They dress her all in black. It's a super somber occasion. America is like, my parents are dead. Someone's dead. One of her maids is like, no one's dead. Be grateful that no one is dead. Weird thing to say, but okay. They round up all of the girls in like the lobby of the castle. I don't know how castles work. Marley is missing. They usher all of the girls, everyone's dressed in black, outside to like, I guess, a courtyard. There's a platform and on the platform, there's like, you know, some like wooden structures. They lead Marley out to this platform and she's still in her Halloween costume and they lead a guard out and he's looking disheveled and they tie them up to this platform. Marley Thames, one of the selected, a daughter of Ilya, was found last night in an intimate moment with this man, Carter Woodwork, a trusted member of the Royal Guard. Miss Thames has broken her vow of loyalty to our Prince Maxon, and Mr. Woodwork has essentially stolen property of the royal family through his relations with Miss Thames. This offense is treason to the royal family. She's a human, not property of the royal family. Oh, it's so sad. And so they whip both of them. And America is freaking out. She's like yelling at Max and she's like, you're a monster. I hate you. What are you doing? So America like tries to rush the stage to try to like, I don't know, save Marley or something. And the guards carry her away. And after this whole ordeal, Maxon comes up to America's room and tries to explain himself. The story 
goes. Cameras who were in the palace capturing the festivities of Halloween found Marley and Carter the night before, and they circulated these pictures and videos. Max had, had to do something. This wasn't something that they could sleep, sweep under the rug because like there was photo evidence of it. And so Max is trying to explain to America that like he had no choice. They should have been killed, but he kept them from being killed. And America is like, fuck you, I hate you. I'm sorry, but I don't think I can do this. I can never stand by and watch someone get hurt like that, knowing that it was my judgment that set them there. I can't be a princess. Super fair. But Maxon is like, you're upset, sleep on it, we'll talk about it later. I'm not gonna send you home right now, which is also fair. Now, you would think that watching your best friend get whipped for having an illicit affair with a guard would make you second guess your own illicit affair with a guard, but no, 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 no. Not America. America is stupid. This just makes her want to be with Aspen even more. Babe, you just saw the consequences play out in real time. You really think this is a good idea? Because I don't fucking think so. Since she's mad at Maxon, she starts sneaking around with Aspen even more. Aspen is talking mad shit about Maxon, talking about how he's a terrible person. How could he allow this to happen? Yeah, it's not great, but like there's some nuance there. Like he is also constrained by a system. He's basically a figurehead. His dad is pulling all the strings. He has no power. And like, just because someone is operating under and even upholding an oppressive system doesn't mean that they as a person are evil. I think there's room for nuance there. Obviously Aspen doesn't give a shit about nuance because he's a stupid idiot. I hate him. I'm, I need a teacher that's like Aspen hater because I'm on the Aspen hate train. And America's upset, so she's not hearing any of that. So some time passes uh, and America and Maxon are still not on speaking terms and America and Aspen are still sneaking around. During one of their illicit meetings, Aspen gives America a button from his guard's uniform. America starts wearing this button on a piece of ribbon around her wrist as a bracelet. I really, really thought that this was going to become important later. Surely someone was going to recognize that this button that America was wearing was a guard's button and that like she was going to get in trouble and that was how her relationship with Aspen was going to get revealed. It never comes back. Maxon talks talks about the button bracelet, he acknowledges it, and never once is he like, hey, that's a guard's button. He's not stupid. You think he would mention it, but he just doesn't, which leads me to believe bad writing. Perhaps this is not a well-written book. So they've been having these little like sort of challenges and assignments throughout this entire book. Most of them are boring, so I've not been bringing them up, but this one is interesting. The girls are split into two teams and they're going to have to put together like a reception to greet royalty from another country. Celeste, Natalie, and Elise are put on one team and Chris and America are on the other team. Celeste, Natalie, and Elise, they are in charge of putting together a reception for the German Federation which is significantly easier because Ilya already has a relationship with the German Federation, so there's not as much riding on this party. Chris and America are put in charge of planning a party for Italy, for the royal family of Italy. They're coming to visit. And this is a big deal for three reasons. First of all, America and Chris are a team of two, so they have less manpower. Second of all, the Germans are apparently super easy to offend, so they have to make sure they get everything exactly right. Third of all, the Italians have been resistant to partnership with Ilya, so there is a lot riding on this evening and they only have four days to get this all put together. Start working on it and things are going well. And then, oh no, a rebel attack. The rebel sirens goes off. Just get a load of this shit. I nodded, heading for the door. Aspen's hand on my back. Before I hit the hallway, he jerked me towards him. I found myself deep in a rough kiss. I know my guy did not just forcibly kiss America with absolutely no warning. That's not chill with me. Don't roughly kiss people without asking, especially, I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care if there's rebels knocking down your door. I don't care if it's life or death. Ask, or at least give some warning. I don't give a shit that there's a rebel attack. Don't kiss people without asking. And also, I hate Aspen, so I don't have to explain myself. He fucking sucks. I hate him. <sighs> and when she gets down to the safe room, Maxine gives her a nice wholesome hug. And they have like a little heart to heart because they're still not on great terms. But he's like, I'm happy you're safe. And she's like, I'm happy you're safe. And we are surprised that I'm team Maxon. Clearly one of these people is far superior. Yeah, so Maxon gives America a nice hug. He apologizes for Halloween. He says he's going to explain everything. And they end the evening on better terms. 
Sorry, I have been talking for so long. I ran out of space on my SD card. Now, if this is a slightly different angle, no, it's not. You're imagining things. You're crazy. Anyway, the next day, it's a nice day, and so they decide to do all their work outside. Everybody, all the selection girlies, the king, and all of his advisors, and Max, and everyone is outside in the gardens. And you'll never guess what happens. Another freaking rebel attack. Get it together, guys. Your country is falling apart. America is too far away from the castle to get there safely, and the rebels are coming at her. So she runs into the forest. Maxon is distraught. He tries to chase after her, but everyone is stopping him because, like, you know, if America dies, no big deal. If the frickin' prince dies, like, then we're gonna have some issues. So America is running into the forest, and she finally outruns the rebels, and she's like, okay, I gotta regroup. So she climbs into a tree. Katniss's impact. Beneath the tree that she's in, two rebels run past her. It's a girl and a guy. The girl's bag breaks open, and a bunch of books falls out. And so she's packing up her books, and she looks up in the tree, and she sees America. This girl curtsies, and then runs away. And America is con- used she's waiting for someone to find her of fucking course aspen is the guard who finds america they take her to the hospital wing just to like make sure she's okay like she has some scrapes and stuff maxin sits by her bed the entire time she's in the hospital wing so i guess things are fine between them during one of their earlier fights america is like maybe you should explore some other options like i don't think i can give you what you need maxin does that he starts getting more serious with chris and then america is mad that he's spending more time with chris even though she is literally the one who told him to do that literally two days after this rebel attack they have their stupid parties because for some reason they can't reschedule these goddamn parties the first day is the german federation party that's celeste natalie and the other ones, par at least their party. And it goes terribly. Everything is wrong. The next day is the Italians party. It goes so well. Everything is perfect. America is bonding with Princess Nicoletta, who is the princess of the Italians. Nicoletta pulls America aside and is like, we are very much interested in forming a bond with a powerful nation, if that nation can change. Unofficially, if there's anything we can do to help you acquire the crown, let us know. You have our full support. And Nicoletta gives America her phone number. Nicoletta is Team America, and I am so here for that. So a few days later, America is hanging out in the women's room, which is basically like where they spend all their days. It's like the queen's salon. Maxon pulls her out of the women's room and is like, I have something to show you. He takes America to the princess suite. It's where the princess lives. It has an adjoining room to Maxon's room. Guess who's in the freaking princess suite right now? Freaking Marley. Maxon is the best. What Maxon was trying to explain to America, but she was too hot headed to let him get a word in edgewise, was he saved Marley and Carter and helped them heal and then helped them get a job in the palace. So suck on that, Aspen. It turns out Maxon is not actually a monster slash terrible person. Aspen is getting sloppy. So one of America's maids saw Aspen in his plain clothes putting this note in America's room. After what happened to Marley and Carter, you're gonna be that stupid? God, Aspen, get it together. Like, I just, I genuinely don't know if it's because he's stupid and incompetent or if he's like actually trying to get them killed. So Aspen and America have another sneaky date. And after this sneaky date, America is like 100% team Aspen, even though literally the day before she was 100% team Maxon. Like girl, make up your mind. She'll probably be happy either way. So like, I'm not understanding the flip-flopping. I just don't get it. America goes back to her room after their sneaky date and she keeps reading Gregory Ilya's diary. Shocker, Gregory Ilya was actually not a very good person. God, who could have seen that one coming? Like the man who overthrew democracy in America and started an absolute monarchy and forced everyone into these oppressive castes and basically sold his daughter off to another country to strengthen the diplomatic bonds. That man's a bad person? <gasps> America is slowly realizing that these journals are actually really fucked up. And she's like, wow, Maxon must know everything that's in these journals. Like, he must also be a terrible person. If Maxon was trying to manipulate you, like how Gregory Ilya did, and like how you think he's trying to, I'm 100% certain 
that he would not have lent you the diaries. There's no way he knew what was in those. He would not have given them to you if he did. I'm 100% certain of that. The girlies get another silly little challenge. And this challenge is they have to come up with like the philanthropy project and they have to present it. You would think that this project would be especially easy for America because she is the only selection girly left who has experienced poverty. You know, she might have some ideas on how to change it. No thoughts, head empty. America has no ideas, nothing, nothing going on up here. So America is already already stressed because she has this big project coming up she has no ideas. Maxon decides it's the perfect time for him to talk about their feelings. Maxon is basically like I'm trying to give you space. I'm trying to let you recover after Halloween and after Marley, but like I don't have infinite time. I have to make a decision. Will I be able to choose you? And America is like, stop pressuring me, like, blah, blah, blah. I, I can't make this decision right now. So Maxon gets mad, and he's like, I'll just go see what Chris is doing. Now America and Maxon are no longer on good terms. And America goes to Aspen to help brainstorm an idea for this philanthropy project. Aspen, a fucking course, is not helpful. He's like, you've changed America. They've changed you. You forget what it's like to be hungry and poor. And America's like, I remember what it's like. I just don't know how to fix it. Truthfully, I have no idea why they're fighting. I don't get it. They're fighting over this stupid project. Not only does she not have any ideas for her project, but now she's like sad and mad. America is reading Ilya's diary. There's a little bit talking about how the casts were made. America is like, kind of concerned by this and so she wants to go to talk to Maxon about it and she walks in on Maxon and Celeste making out. America freaks the fuck out. She's like of course Maxon knew about the diaries. He's a terrible person. He's just like Gregory Ilya. Like he's just trying to marry someone for their body. Again making all these assumptions like if you just talk to somebody things would be fine. So Maxon comes into her room to try to talk about things and America shoves him Violence is never the answer. I don't care how mad you are. You do not push people. You're not a child. Like, these are things that I tell my four-year-old. And, like, not, not even. My four-year-olds don't push people. And so Maxon leaves. And America decides she does not want to be the princess. And she wants to leave. But Maxon's not kicking her out. And so she decides if Maxon's not going to kick her off, she's going to cause problems on purpose until he has no choice but to kick her off. I can't keep defending this behavior. I really can't. So it's the day of the projects being presented. America is going last. All the other projects go well. And so America gets up there and she gets on national television and she's like, I propose that we abolish the caste system. Obviously, the king is livid about this. He's like, okay, like, how do you propose we do that, idiot? And she's like, actually, I did not think about that. The king is like, I don't care what you say, Max, and you have to kick her off. She's causing problems on purpose. I'm the king. You have to do what I say. Max and pulls a, can you stop being my coach for just one second and just be my dad? And my name is Troy, dad, not Bolton. Can you stop being the king for five minutes and just be my father? This is my choice. You got to make yours. Now I want to make mine. No one is leaving without my say-so. The king is like, do you want me to deal with this or are you going to deal with this? And Max is like, okay, I'll deal with it. And as if all of this wasn't enough drama for one night, you remember Natalie? I don't blame you if you don't remember Natalie. She's super forgettable. Natalie has a sister apparently, and apparently her sister got murdered by rebels. So Natalie decides to leave the competition to focus on her mental health. So now there's only four girlies. So the next morning, America is walking in the hallways and she runs in to Maxon by the hospital wing. Oh no, a rebel attack. Now, America and Maxon are too far away from the main safe room, so they have to go to one of the servant safe rooms. They're in this tiny little safe room. I'm into this. I don't know what it is about like a forced proximity trope, but I am so on board. Put them in a locked room and make them talk about their feelings. My kink is good, healthy communication. So yeah, they're in this tiny room with nowhere to go talking about their feelings. And Maxon is like, I'm so sorry. And America's like, no, it's okay. And then America notices that Maxon's back is covered in blood. And he's like, yeah, my dad fucking beats me. And so America cleans and dresses his wounds. And America's like, so I'm leaving. And he's like, well, I don't think I can do anything to stop it. So like, yeah, I'm sorry, but you're leaving. So they make out a little bit. America goes back to her room and she gets dressed to leave the competition and go back home. 
she's talking to Aspen before she leaves and she's like, I just need some space and some time to get over this whole experience. Don't contact me when I get home. You were the one who changed us when you left me in that treehouse. And you keep thinking if you push hard enough, you can make everything go back to before that moment. It doesn't work that way. Give me a chance to choose you. you why wouldn't you choose me, Mare? Aren't I your only choice? He asks, sadness dripping from his voice. Yes. Doesn't that bother you? I don't want to be the girl you end up with because my only other option isn't available and you never looked at anyone else. Do you really want to get me by default? He spoke intensely. I don't care how I get you, Mare. Suddenly, he charged at me, taking my face in his hands. Aspen kissed me fiercely, willing me to remember what he was to me. I couldn't kiss him back. Again! This bitch is forcibly kissing people. That's assault! That's not okay. Beforehand, heat of the moment, like, whatever. I mean, like, not whatever, but, like, yeah, rebel attack, emotions are running high, and, like, then there was still, like, maybe some chance for romance. America said to you, she said, I need some space, I need some time, and after that conversation, you're like, now's the perfect time to kiss her. That is not how it works. Sorry, I'm getting violent. This is not okay. So America is about to leave, and Maxon runs down and is like, just wait a second, um, you can stay as long as you stop causing problems on purpose. This is a win for America. But then Maxon says, there is no question that you've had my heart from the beginning. By now you have to know that. But what you do not have right now is my trust. I've shown you so many of my secrets, defended you in every way I can. But when you aren't pleased with me, you act rashly. You shut me out, blame me, or most impressively try to change the entire country. I need to know that I can depend on you. I need to know that you can keep my secrets, trust my judgment, and not hold a thing from me. I need you to be completely honest with me and stop questioning every decision I make. I need you to have faith in me, America. I'm really proud of our main characters here because they are both setting boundaries and communicating. Congratulations, guys. You're doing the bare minimum. America decides that she is going to be the perfect princess she's finally like i'm in the competition i'm in it to win it which if you remember is exactly how the last book ended so like we ended basically at the exact same spot that we ended the first book in but that's the end one more book let's get started book three america is back in the game girlies she is asleep and maxin wakes her up and is like you have to come downstairs right now as always america's first thought is like oh my god my family's dead so she rushes downstairs, she's in her, like, nightdress, and she's like, what is happening? And Max is like, don't freak out, there are rebels in the castle. They want to talk to us. They specifically requested to see America. So, these two rebels are the girl and the guy who caught up to him. My fucking camera's dying, are you kidding me? We're powering through. So, it's the girl and the guy who caught up to America when she ran into the forest. Remember that? They introduce themselves as Georgia and August Ilya. So, some important lore for you. Gregory Ilya founded the country and he had three kids. His daughter, he sold off to like a diplomat to strengthen their bonds with these other countries. His oldest son is the one who held the selection and then became king. And his youngest son apparently died. So the oldest son, he married a daughter of Ilya, became king, and then like three months after he got married, he died mysteriously. And his widow was like, I'll marry his cousin so that we can keep the royal bloodline pure. She marries Porter Shreve, which is how Maxon ended up Maxon Shreve, not Maxon Ilya. Maxon is like, are you coming for my throne? Because you're like a direct descendant of Gregory Ilya. And August is like, no, I don't want to be king. I don't give a shit. Max is like, well, then why? Why the fuck are you here? So basically, August is like, I think you should marry America. Maxon freaks out. He's like, you don't get to tell me who I'm marrying. This is my choice. This is my life. So the Northern Rebels are not into overthrowing the monarchy. Just because one king is good in an absolute monarchy doesn't mean that like a couple guys down the line isn't going to be like an actual monster, you know? Maybe we should overthrow the monarchy. Just a thought. Anyway, Maxon freaks out, and everyone is kind of confused because we all thought that Maxon and America were in love. August was like, I don't know why this is such a big deal, dude. Like, we thought you were already gonna get married, and Maxon's like, I just, you can't take this choice away from me. And they're like, oh, okay, well, like, it doesn't really matter if you marry America because we also have another girly competing in the selection. Maxon's like, tell me who it is. And August is like, obviously, we're not gonna tell you who it is. You freaked out because we suggested that you marry someone that you 
actually like. So Georgia pulls America aside and is like, listen, girly, like, if you ever need anything, give me a call. She gives America her phone number. Hopefully this is enough battery to last me to the end of the third book, but we'll see. Where do we leave off? America is still reeling from this conversation with literal rebels. So she walks back to her room. Maxon shows up. Surprise, surprise, Maxon and America are fighting again. Because America is upset that the insinuation that Maxon marry America sent him off the handle. Kind of fair. Like, she thought they were on good terms. She thought they were in love. It's like, you know, when if someone's like, oh my god, you guys would make such a cute couple, and the other person's like, ew, no, what? Us? Ew. Turns out Maxon actually had come to make peace with her. He's like, I'm sick of fighting. Like, if you tell me that you love me, if you tell me that I'm the one you choose, like, this will all be over. I will end the selection tomorrow if you tell me to, because I want you. He takes her up to the roof, and so they're, like, dancing in the rain on the roof, and America in her brain is like oh my god i love maxon like a normal rational person would be like let me tell him america is like i can't be the one to say it first he needs to tell me that he loves me even though he literally did in what world tell me you love me and i'll end this tomorrow is not a declaration of love it reeks of heteronormativity i'm just gonna say it why does the man need to be the one to say i love you first straight people riddle me that After what happened with Natalie, remember her sister got murdered by rebels, the palace has sent some guards to hang out with all of the girlies' families. All these guards that they sent to the girls' families keep on abandoning post and just disappearing. That's weird. I hope this doesn't turn into a major plot point right at the end. For some reason, and I legitimately have no idea why, Maxon and America decide it's a good idea to sneak out of the palace to go talk to August and Georgia again. They end up in a palace truck in like the sketchy part of the city to go meet with the rebels. Of course, it all goes horribly wrong. America gets shot in the arm they bring her back to the castle one of her maids like stitches up her bullet hole you would think that like this pivotal plot point becomes like something that's important after this moment it never comes up again the only lasting consequence of this literal bullet hole is that she can no longer wear strapless dresses which i think is a net positive because those strapless dresses are Fogly. The bullet hole is the real hero here. I have never seen a strapless dress that I like. Really, it was a good thing that she got shot. So a few days after America gets literally shot, the palace is hosting a tea party. The girls have to invite two people to be their personal guests to this tea party. So she gives our good friend Nicoletta, the princess of Italy, a call and is like, hey girl, you want to come to a party? And Nicoletta's like, sure. And she also calls Georgia because America brought the princess of Italy. She wins the whole thing. Like it's not a competition as to who can bring the best person, but like if it were, America would have won. She pulls Georgia and Nicoletta aside and is like, hey girls, let's do some illegal under the table cash to like buy weapons, I think. I am unsure, but um, they do something that breaks the law. But again, barely comes up later, so I don't care. Our selection girlies need to do something called the convicting. One of the like ways that they can prove that they're going to be a good princess is by participating in the convicting. The convicting is meant to be a symbol of your submission to the law. A man who has committed a crime, most likely theft, will be brought in. These cases are worthy of a whipping, but these men will spend some time in jail instead. You will send them there. It's like a symbolic thing. They go up and they like, in their pretty dress, are like, you can go to jail now. Obviously, our girl America has big old problems with this. She does not want to send people to jail. But she made that promise to Maxon and to the king that she would stop causing problems on purpose. So she's gonna try her best. Aspen comes in and causes problems on purpose. He's like, I fucking knew the palace was gonna change you. You're the worst. And he's like, you should not go through with this. You should not do this. It's immoral and it's bad. And like, you, you're better than this. And America is like, hey, wait a second, Aspen. You're a fucking guard. Have you never gone through with an order that you thought was immoral because like, it's your job? We're in the same boat, dude. I don't have a choice. So it's the day of the convicting. America, she's like, if none of us do it, they can't fire us all. But someone is like, she's tricking us. She goes last. So if none of us do it and then she does it, she looks good. I truly don't believe that America is smart enough to have come up with that plan. She has no critical thinking, no foresight. She's not like master manipulating everyone to make herself look good. All of the girls go through with it. 
And then it's America's time, and she gets up there, and the person who she's supposed to send to jail, his crime was stealing clothes for his daughters. And the sentence that he's getting for this crime is a life sentence. And America can't do it. So she takes off all of her jewelry, like expensive jewels that were a gift from Maxim, and she gives them to this man, and she goes, go forth and pay your debt to the king. Obviously, this goes over terrible with King Clarkson. He said the only reason she's allowed to stick around is if she stops causing problems, and this is causing a problem. But the people of Ilya saw this on TV, and now they really like America. They're like, she's so kind and compassionate. Very Princess Diana coded. The king is like, well, I can't send her home because the people love her. I'll make her read some propaganda. Very Katniss Everdeen coded, if we're being honest. So America's like, no, I will not be reading propaganda for you. And Maxon is like, come on, girl, just do it. Like, what's the big deal? Maxon is angry that America won't read propaganda for his dad because he thinks it means she doesn't love him. Mm, like, she does love you, but, like, propaganda's pretty bad. Being the face of propaganda, that's not good or fun. That's that's pretty rough, actually. And also, he's all up in arms about her not wanting to do propaganda because that seemingly means that she doesn't love him. When this is the same guy who, when someone suggested that he and America get married, he freaked out. Dude, I liked you, but like, you're on thin ice. Maxon and America are once again fighting who is surprised, not me. And then America's dad fucking dies. So Maxon convinces his dad to send America home for four days so that she can grieve with her family and attend her dad's funeral. While she's back at her house, we learn that America's dad was a rebel, which is big thing number one that happens while America's back home. The second big thing that happens while America's at home is that America and Aspen have this big old fight. America basically yells, me and Aspen did have a relationship. Everyone in the house hears this, including one of America's maids who came with her. And America's like, can you like not tell Maxon about this? The maid is like, um, he's my boss. Like, you're not my boss. So if he asks me about it, I can't can't lie to him. And America's like, oh, fuck. Okay, well, I'll tell him. So don't tell him until I tell him. When she gets back to the palace, she's gonna tell Maxon everything. They're gonna clean the slate. Everything's gonna be great. On the plane home, Aspen keeps on trying to talk to America. And he keeps on starting his sentence, I will always love you. I will never stop loving you. But, and America's like, stop talking right now. Stop talking right now. I have to deal with Maxon first and then we'll deal with this shit. So America gets back to the palace. All of the selection girlies are there. All 35, all 34 of them, because Marley is not there. And America's like, what's going on? Chris is like, Maxon eliminated all of the other girlies last night. And so it's between the two of us. He's going to announce his engagement tomorrow. America sees Chris's necklace and she pulls Chris's sign. She's like, girl, you're a rebel. And Chris is like, yeah, please don't tell anybody. And America's like, sure, fine. I won't. So America goes up to her room and Maxon is there and he has a little gift wrapped up for her and she opens it and it's a picture of a house and she's like oh like did you take this picture it's so pretty because Maxon likes photography and he's like no I didn't uh, but the picture isn't the gift it's the house is the gift and America's like oh shit he figured while I was away he discovered that he like doesn't actually love me and like he's sending me home and he's giving me a nice house and he's gonna live forever after with Chris and Maxon's like no uh the house is for your family I thought you might want them closer when you were living in the palace and America's like, you mean you're gonna propose to me? And Maxon's like, obviously I'm gonna propose to you. You're the only one I've loved this entire time. And America's like, can you just like stay over tonight? Like I haven't seen you for four days. I missed you. Like just hang out with me tonight, sleep over. And he's like, okay, but I have to leave early tomorrow. So next morning, Maxon is leaving. And I don't know how this happens, but Maxon ends up tickling America. Let me just say, if an adult tickles another adult, jail. Tickling is for children from their parents. That is the only acceptable instance of tickling. If someone tries to tickle me, I will be punching them. Anyway, so Max and tickles America, and America, like, shrieks and is like, ah! So the guard who's standing outside is like, oh, fuck, like, someone's being attacked in there. She's screaming, so he rushes in, and of course, the guard is fucking Aspen, Maxon, who's only wearing underwear because he slept in his underwear, and America in her nightdress, you know, on the bed together, and he's like, Oh, fucking shit. They, they fucked. They had sex. America is obviously super embarrassed. Maxon leaves to go to work, and America goes outside to talk to Aspen. He's like, like, I knew you weren't gonna choose me, but, like, you didn't have to sleep with him. And America puts her hands on his chest and gets real close and goes, I did not sleep with him. And right then, when she's, like, pressed up against his body, guess who comes around the fucking corner? Maxon and Chris! And Maxon is like, I knew it. 
I fucking knew it. I knew it was him. I knew it this whole time. But I told myself I was crazy. I told myself that if it was him, you would have told me. You wouldn't lie to me. I erupted into sobs. Maxim, please, I'm so sorry. It's not what it looked like. I swear I love you. He sauntered up to me, his eyes dead. Of all the lies you told me, that's the one I resent the most. So he's mad. And the next morning... It's time for him to announce the engagement. And so America is sitting up there in front of everybody. It's like everyone is sitting there watching. She's like starting to cry. And Max is like, don't you fucking cry. Like you hold it together until you're home. Like do not embarrass me. And then a guard comes up behind Celeste, one of the selection girlies, and shoots her in the head. Pandemonium. You remember all those guards who were like uh, abandoning post? Turns out they weren't actually abandoning posts. They were getting murdered by Southern rebels. Their uniforms were getting stolen. And now all the rebels are here killing everybody. America is like standing up there and a rebel comes up to her and shoots a gun at her. And Maxon jumps in front of the bullet and gets shot. And he's lying on the floor and he's bleeding out. And America's like, I'm so sorry. Maxon's like, no, I'm sorry. Like I was about to ruin both of our lives choosing someone else just because I was angry. Break my heart. Break it a thousand times if you like. It was only ever yours to break. That is so cute. Aspen is like, girl, we gotta go. Like, we gotta get you to a safe room. Maxon grabs Aspen and is like, she fucking lives. I don't care if any other person in this palace survives this. Like, America has to survive. Aspen takes America to a safe room and America is hanging out there for like a long time. She gets a gun at some point and she's like sitting in this tiny metal room shooting at a tiny metal lock with nothing to hide behind. Bullet probably ricocheting around the entire room because she's stupid. After some indescribed amount of time, the door unlocks. America walks walks out and it's just like destruction and so she walks to the hospital wing and she sees aspen and aspen has been shot in the leg and aspen's like listen i kept on trying to tell you this but like i don't love you she just asks the random guard she's like is max in here the guard is like no i'm so sorry she's like oh my god he's dead and then some other guy's like no what the fuck are you talking about maxon isn't dead he's just recovering in his room because he's the king now and america's like oh fuck yeah not only is my boyfriend still alive his dad who's causing problems on purpose for me he's dead this is a win-win situation for me she goes up to maxon's room maxon's like listen girlie i have something for you and maxon gives her a proposal to abolish the casts the end i tricked you there's an epilogue they get married in the epilogue that's it that's the entire epilogue that is the end of the selection series i adore this series as i said this is to me the pinnacle of literature it's fantastic there is a companion series based on maxon and america's children i hate the companion series it is garbage so um let me know if you want to see a video on that bye